my conscious mind, get into my subconscious, get into my id, get into my ego, my super ego, get into the, my, my unawareness. Hmm. Get into the place where I don't even know it exists. But it's there. Get into the place where I feel things and the place where I think things. Examine me. And then he makes a statement in prayer. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I've led a blameless life. His prayer is, isn't a question of worthiness. His prayer is not a question of Pharisaic self-righteousness. David's not saying, you know, I'm honest and I'm perfect and I'm 100% uh, absolutely guiltless and faultless and I haven't done anything wrong and so I'm asking you to vindicate me everybody's coming against me I've got stuff flying at me from every direction and I'm asking for your your vindication uphold my cause God um, I'm asking you to vindicate me because I'm perfect no that's not what he's saying matter of fact David makes it clear that no one's worthy of God's vindication. How many of you know this morning that were it not for the grace of God in Christ Jesus, you'd still be unworthy? Amen. No, David here is not claiming innocence. But David makes a declaration that makes him worthy of vindication. Look, he says... Vindicate me, O Lord, I've led a blameless life. I've trusted in the Lord without wavering. So, wait, where is his blamelessness? We know that David was a murderer. We know that David was an adulterer. We know that he was, the Bible calls him a man of war. He loved war. He loved blood. The Bible calls him a man of blood, a man of war. David walked out of the will of God, violated the will of God. David committed sins. Just go through the list. Go through the litany. He ranks among the highest in terms of infractions. David was no angel. But he says, I've led a blameless life. Seems like an absolute contradiction. Seems like something that makes absolutely no sense. And in the natural, uh, a Pharisee would look at him, a judge would look at him, an accuser would look at him and say, oh, no, 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 look, I got a list of stuff you've done. Come on, let's go over the list. Come on. Day after day, come on, let's go back to time and place. Let's go back to incident. I got witnesses that can prove you're not blameless. So what is David saying then? He makes an audacious statement. I've led a blameless life. What in the world could David possibly mean? Because in the natural, he's guilty. In the natural, he's culpable. In the natural, from a religious perspective, you'd look at David and say, hey man, you're as guilty as the day is long. He says, but vindicate me. I've led a blameless life. Where's his blamelessness? His blamelessness is in the next sentence. Look, I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. If there's any place I'm blameless, it's there. If there's any place that I'm guiltless, it's there. If there's one area in my life as you examine me, as you probe me, you will know, God, that there is one area in which I have never faltered and I've never failed. I failed here and I failed there. And I failed there and I failed over there. And I failed that time and that time and that time. And you know all about it. But if there's one place I've never failed, it's this. I have trusted in you no matter what without wavering. David identifies this one area as the criteria for justification. 
David's declaration of unwavering trust and genuine delight in his God is his basis for requesting vindication. You know, a lot of people will look at you and judge you and tell you, you don't have a right to pray. You don't have a right to ask for mercy. You don't have a right to ask for God's grace. You don't have a right to ask for God's goodness. You've committed this sin and that sin and that sin and that sin. And you've missed it here and missed it there. And you failed to cross this amount of T's and Failed to dot that I over there. You don't have a right to do anything in terms of asking for the mercy and the grace of God. You you, you, you missed it on every turn, pal. David said, I may have. Matter of fact, I did. But there's one thing I've done right. I've trusted in God no matter what. I have looked to God when I've been in trouble. I've looked to him when I've been in misery. I've looked to him when I've been sick. I've looked to him when I've been in despair. I've looked to him when there was nobody else to look to. I've looked to God when everybody else left me and deserted me, when family talked about me, when everybody pointed fingers at me and told me I was no good. I looked to God. God as my source and in him I put my trust and I have not wavered. David asked God to examine him according to his mercy and his willingness to be used by God. God, it's only your mercy that allows me to even talk to you. It's only your mercy that allows me to even approach you right now. If I come in myself, if I come in my flesh, I have no right. All but goodness and mercy not only follow me all the days of my life, but they proceed the way that I go. And so I come to you uh, based on mercy and goodness and grace uh, and your love for me. I come to you uh, asking uh, that you would use me for your glory. I may not be much, but use me. I may not have the talent that somebody else has, uh, but I want to be used by you. I may not be as good as somebody. I may not be as righteous uh, as somebody else, but God, uh, I'm asking you to use me for for your glory. God, I'm looking for your glory and nothing else. I'm not looking for mine, but to you, God, be all the praise. David's offer of service is seen in the phrase. He says, test me, O Lord, watch, and try me. Everybody say, try me. Back in the day, when somebody tried to mess with you, you know, oh, you ain't nothing. You know, really? Try me. Come on, try me. David wasn't using the word try in terms of examination or test. Don't misread it. He's not talking about a trial. The word try me, the phrase try me there in the Hebrew is this. Test me, examine me, watch, watch, and then Literally in the Hebrew, use me in a venture. You got a project? Use me. You got something you want to do? Use me. You got something that you want to construct? Use me. You got somebody that needs to be witnessed to? Use me. You got somebody that needs to be prayed for? Use me. You got somebody who needs a word in due season and an encouragement? Use me. Use me in a venture. Use me in a kingdom project. Use me for your glory. Whatever it is you're doing, uh, the songwriter said, whatever it is in your, you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I want to be used by you, God. I may not be all that. But I trust you. I know you're my source. I know you are my guide. I know you are my rock. I know you are my savior. 
I know you are my Lord. I know you're my protector. I know you're my healer. I know you're my deliverer. I know you're my righteousness. I know you are the shade of my right hand. I know that no matter what I do and where I go, you love me. I trust in you no matter what. I may not be perfect like somebody else, but oh God, there's one thing I'm perfect in, and it's in my trust in you. David said, there's, there's one thing I know how to do. I know how to praise. And with a mouth full of praise and a load of guilt, I'll still praise you. With shame on me, I'll still praise you. With the remnants and the residue of what I did last night, I'm still going to praise you. Don't ever let anybody tell you you don't have a right to praise God your praise is not predicated on the validity of your own virtue your praise is predicated on the worthiness of the God whom you praise he's worthy of your I don't care who you are he is worthy of your praise if you had to be perfect to praise him, you may as well go shut your mouth. Because nobody. I, I got to deal with Pharisees in the room. I said nobody. I got to deal with Sadducees in the room. Uh, nobody. No. I got to deal with judges and accusers in the room. Uh, nobody. I got to deal with critical people in the room. Uh, uh, nobody. I got to deal with the self-righteous. Uh, nobody. I got to deal with the people who think they did it better than everybody else. I said nobody. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, except him. Everybody has a right to praise him because you know him and you trust in him. Anybody know him in here? Anybody trust him in here? Anybody know he's good and he's good all the time? Anybody know that he's holy and he's righteous and he's awesome and he's magnificent and he's wonderful? Anybody know he's worthy of your praise? David said, I know one thing. You're worthy of praise and you've equipped me to give it to you. You've given me a tongue. You've given me a mouth. You've given me air in my lungs to give you glory. You've given me hands to lift up to you. Uh, you've given me a song uh, and I'm going to sing it. Uh, you've given me ability and I'm going to use it uh, to give you praise and honor and glory. Amen. David was a man of praise and a lover of worship. Uh, someone mentioned to me the other day, a pastor they, they, in a, in a Seventh-day Adventist church was a friend sent me something on Facebook, posted, he said, it was a, 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 a video of Hezekiah Walker. You know that, that song, that, word, that praise song, that every praise is to our God, every word of worship in one accord. Come on. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Do, 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 hallelujah. To our God. Come on. Glory, hallelujah, unto our God. Right here. Every praise, every praise is to our God. So he sent that to me. He said, Pastor D, he said, is this the kind of music you guys do in your church for praise and worship? And I said, praise, yes. See, a lot of people don't even know the distinction. They think it's a general category, praise and worship. I said, praise, yes. I said, worship, another story. And so I sent him some videos. I post some videos. With my praise, I bring glory. With my lips, I will sing. I throw some Clint Brown on him. With my hands, I will praise you. Oh, Lord, I bless 
your name. And I threw some Gary Oliver on him, and I threw some Vonnie Lopez on him, and I threw... I said, I said, that's worship. David said, I know how to praise him. I know how to draw him into my presence. I know how to draw him into my praise. He'll, he'll sit right down in the middle of my praise. If I just open my mouth, I don't care what I'm going through. I, I, all I got to do is open my mouth. All I got to do is lift my hands and give him a praise. But then once he's here, I know how to keep him. Once he's here, once he shows up, I know how to hold him. Yeah, God, uh, once he's here, I know how to get into the secret place of the Most High. Lift my hands, open my mouth, and just tell him you're worthy. You're worthy of my praise. You're holy. You're righteous. That song that we did earlier, holy, holy Lord. Holy, holy Lord. All creation bows before you. Holy, holy, Lord. that's worship. It all comes out of David's writings. David said, I may not be perfect, but there's one thing I know how to do. I know how to praise. And I love to worship. David not only was used that way, but when he said, try me, try me. He was saying this, I got a passion for your house and it, it makes me want to construct a temple for you. And I know you're not going to let me construct the temple that my son is going to build. I understand that. But you've given me the passion and you've given me the burden and you've given me the vision of it. So in the meantime, let me just construct a temporary dwelling in which to house the Ark of the Covenant so you can show up in the middle of your people and so we can give you glory while we yet live David welcomed divine examination he didn't run from the doctor's appointment anybody in here ever put off a doctor's appointment oh yeah yeah I'm gonna have to reschedule I got some witnesses in here yeah, I'm, I'm really busy. Yeah, yeah. When? Uh, second Tuesday of next week. The rest of you will get that this afternoon. No, David welcomed divine examination. Knowing that in his inner being, where his affections held their court, that the one thing that God would find if he examined him would be David's delight in God. If you find anything that's worthwhile, if you find anything that's noteworthy, if you find anything that's worthy of mention, he said, you won't find one thing. You ain't going to find two. You ain't going to find three. God, I don't have a list of accomplishments and achievements and, and things that I'm going to laud and applaud myself about. I, I know that there's no good thing, like Paul said, dwelleth in me. I know that. I, I know that. The good that I want to do, I don't do. The, the, the thing I do want to do, I don't do that either. I get it. But if you examine me, God, you're going to find one thing. Mm hmm if you probe me, you're going to find one thing. If you get the magnifying glass of the Holy Ghost and look on the inside of me, you're going to find one thing that pleases you. He wrote about it in Psalm 27 and 4. He said it this way. One thing. Everybody say one thing. He says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only. Ah, oh God. This only, shout only. He said, this only do I seek, here it is, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. 
Why? Because I want to get healed, because I want to get blessed, because I want to get favor, because I want to get a, a, a supernatural manifestation of his power. I can get all that, that. But here's where my issue is. Here's my heart. Here's my agenda. Here is my motive. Here it is, God. This one thing do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? Watch. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Let me get in there so I can worship you. Let me get in there so I can praise you. Let me get into your temple so I can give you all the worthy praise that belongs to your name. I just want to look at you. Oh God. I just want to observe you. I just want to give you the glory that belongs to your name. David's joy then was found in God and the honor of his name. Not David's name, not anyone else's name, but God's rather. It was found in God and the honor of his name. David's satisfaction in life. I don't know where your satisfaction comes from. When I was a kid, the Rolling Stones. I can't believe those guys are still playing music. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you see them play, they look like those, those skeletons in Disneyland in the Haunted Mansion. That's what they look. They still doing it, though. They, they, they did a song when I was a kid called, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. David said, I, I, I've, I've, I've searched everywhere. I've been the king. I've had more women than you can shake a stick at. Married some of them. The rest of them are concubines, and the rest of them we ain't talking about. <laughs> had the finest affair of wine, food. I've entertained dignitaries, and they've lauded and applauded me. I've had more money than, than, than most people have in their entire lifetime. Matter of fact, most of it, he said, I gave away to the house of God. The sweet song singer of Israel. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. David said, none of those things brought me any real satisfaction. They were good for the moment. David's one satisfaction in life was found in giving glory to God Most High. It's only one thing that really does it for me. There's only one thing that satisfies my deepest longing. There's only one thing that reaches down to the inside of who I really am. And when I connect with that, then I truly am satisfied. And it is to lift my hands and open my mouth and declare that you are worthy. Amen. You and you alone are God most high. There's nobody like you. Nobody beside you. No one else even compares with you. No one can stand on the same platform with you. I'll never forget one time in ministry. I was on the platform and God said, get off. Just like that. He said, get off. He said, I want to appear and no one can stand next to me. I'll never forget. I ran off the platform. Stood over on the side. It was in another building. And the awesome power of God showed up in that room and signs and wonders broke out. David said, there's nobody like you. No one even compares with you. You are God and you alone are God. Buddha doesn't compare, and Krishna doesn't compare, and Confucius doesn't compare, and religions doesn't, don't compare. 
Nothing compares with him. No one compares with him. David said, my joy and my delight and my satisfaction is in giving glory to you. So David's prayer here for vindication isn't really motivated or driven by any particular sense of need. Instead, look, it was a prayer of commitment. And in this prayer, David takes great joy in knowing that if God examined him, he would only find that one intention to continue to trust in God and to serve him faithfully. When we get to the New Testament in the book of Acts, Paul is preaching in the 13th chapter. Preaching in a place called Pisidian Antioch and he's giving the history of Israel. And he gets to the era of the kings and he gets to David and he said, And God said that Saul was not equipped to continue being the king. And he displeased God. He said, but then he found David, watch this, and God himself said, everybody say God said it. Uh, he said, and God himself said, I have found David a man after my own heart. Hallelujah. I came to tell you this morning that you can be like David. If you'll make God your first choice, if you'll make God your object of worship, if you will make him your satisfaction that satisfied every longing in your soul this morning, you can have a relationship with him and you'll stand guiltless before him because he knows your heart. He knows you are the lover of his life in, in essence, that you love him more than your own. That there is nothing and no one more important than him. If that's you this morning, if you want to move into that dimension of loving God with everything that you have and loving God with everything that you are, stand to your feet right now, lift your hands, uh, and begin to give him some worthy praise. Uh, begin to give him some glory. God, I love you. God, I praise you. God, I magnify you. I may not be perfect, uh, but I love you. I may not be righteous in man's eyes, but I love you and you love me. Test me and then try me. Use me for your glory. I'm here to be of service to you. I'm here to be used by you. My heart is for your kingdom. My heart is for your glory. I've come to give you the praise. I've come to give you the honor. That's why I'm here today. Lift your hands and sing, Jesus.